step one domination, and we're going to be covering the drugs that treat HSV type 1 and 2, CMV, and VZV today. The drugs we're going to cover today is acyclovir, with the prodrug being valacyclovir, gancyclovir, with the prodrug being valgancyclovir, penficlovir, with the prodrug being famcyclovir, foscarnet, and sidofovir. So the mechanism of action is that for a cyclovir, sorry about that, messing up right there. A cyclovir uses a thymidine kinase, thymidine kinase. And this particular enzyme phos adds a phosphate group to a nucleotide when it has no phosphates on it. So it will monophosphorylate a nucleotide. And this nucleotide that a cyclovir just happens to be is a guanosine analog. So it acts as a regular guanosine base. And thymidine kinase is, fine with, is found within uh, viral cells, the ones of which these drugs will treat. So the thymidine kinase will attach a phosphate group. And when it attaches that first phosphate group, it can then follow up with a second and a third using other kinases that's not viral thymidine kinase. So why this is effective is because this thymidine kinase is only found in the viral, is in the viral cells, is in the virus itself. It's not found in your human host cell. So it's protective against your regular host cells because when this guanosine nucleotide triphosphate is formed, it's actually not a regular guanosine base. So when it ends up being formed, it will inhibit RNA, I'm sorry, DNA polymerase. And it's only going to end up inhibiting the viral DNA polymerase because the virus is the only one that has the viral thymidine kinase. The next one is ganciclovir. Ganciclovir acts in the exact same way except the kinase that monophosphorylates the guanosine analog. So this is also a guanosine analog. And the kinase that phosphorylates this one for the very first phosphate group is going to be UL97 kinase. That's specific for ganciclovir, UL97 kinase. So for a cyclovir, it's viral thymidine kinase that's going to add the very first phosphate group. And that only takes place in the viral cells because the virus is the only one that has this thymidine kinase. Well, the same is true for ganciclovir. Ganciclovir, the viral cells are the only ones that has the UL97 kinase. So this will not damage, even though this inhibits DNA polymerase. And you may be thinking, well, that would inhibit our normal human cells. And it will harm any cell that it runs into. Well, it can never, mon it can never begin the, pro the process of adding phosphate groups to a nucleoside, turning it into a nucleotide triphosphate eventually, because this UL97 kinase is not present in normal host cells only in the viral cells. So that's how ganciclovir works. So then the next one is penciclovir. And penciclovir acts exactly like a cyclovir. The only difference is penciclovir it treats things that are a little bit different. The only difference is that penciclovir will treat the topical form. For example, if you had um, some sort of infection with herpes simplex virus uh, type 1 or 2 and it's on the surface of the skin. Well, this is where penciclovir would work better. So then you would use penciclovir instead of a cyclovir, whereas a cyclovir treats more of the systemic uh, problems involving the virus. So that's the only difference. So the mechanism of action is exactly the same as a cyclovir. It has it uses the viral thymidine kinase to monophosphorylate this guanosine analog and that will eventually then be turned into a di uh, nucleotide diphosphate. That will be two phosphates and then the triphosphate. And then when it's a nucleotide triphosphate using this guanosine analog, it will incorporate into the DNA and inhibit DNA polymerase. And it inhibit, not only does it inhibit DNA polymerase, the viral DNA polymerase specifically, it also acts as a chain breaker. So in the case that it would get put into the DNA chain, it will basically destroy the DNA chain. So that works to destroy the virus. Uh, the next one we're going to cover is Foscarnet. And the way I learned it is that Foscarnet, you see the beginning Fos, 
This is a pyrophosphate, pyrophosphate analog. And this doesn't need to even worry about being um, uh, phosphor phosphorylated at all. I'm sorry, to put the phosphate group. So it doesn't even need to worry about that. It basically binds directly to a spot on the DNA polymerase, binds directly on the spot of the DNA polymerase on what's called a pyrophosphate binding site of the viral DNA polymerase, and it will inhibit that, and that's how it gets its effects. So it doesn't have to worry about uh, adding the phosphate groups and turning a nucleoside into a nucleotide monophosphate and then a, a, a diphosphate and triphosphate. It can just use this pyrophosphate analog and directly inhibit DNA polymerase on the pyrophosphate analog binding site. So that's pretty straightforward. And then the very last one is sodafovir. The cool thing about sodafovir is it can, it only uses host cell, host cell um, DNA polymerase inhibition. Now you may be able to see a problem in sodafovir because there's no sort of distinguishing characteristic. Like with, like look at the other drugs. With the pyrophosphate analog, it binds and inhibits specifically the viral up here at the top. It inhibits viral DNA polymerase. It only targets the pyrophosphate analog site on viral DNA polymerases. With these other drugs, acyclovir and gancyclovir, these inhibit only viral DNA polymerase. The reason is because the reason is because only the viral cells have this thymidine kinase to put the first phosphate on to then use the host cells to get to use other kinases to get the second phosphate and the third phosphate. But a, a, a normal human host cell could never get the first phosphate on here. And the reason is because the normal human host cell doesn't have this thymidine kinase. As just like gamciclovir, the normal human host cell doesn't have UO97 kinase. So it will never be able to, to put that mono, to turn into a monophosphate to begin with. So that's the reason why when you look at a drug like sodafovir, it targets any, it doesn't matter what it is. It's just going to target any DNA polymerase, including viruses, including host cells. So the nephrotoxicity is far worse on sodafovir. And we'll talk about how to get around that. So next we're going to look at the side effects. So starting with the cyclovir, there may be other side effects than just that. Cyclovir. I'm going to go over the main ones tested. The first important one to know for acyclovir, crystalline nephrotoxicity. Crystalline nephrotoxicity. This basically, this drug can form uh, nephrotoxic crystals in the tubules, and that causes nephrotoxicity. So very important to know, acyclovir causes crystalline nephrotoxicity. For ganciclovir, Ganciclovir also causes nephrotoxicity, but not crystalline nephrotoxicity. And then on top of that, ganciclovir causes a decrease in all white blood cells, or you could sometimes see just a decrease in neutrophils. And it can, and it can cause a decrease in platelets. Now, the reason I just didn't go ahead and say it causes pancytopenia is because you see how it doesn't necessarily affect the red blood cells. It affects all the white blood cells and it affects the platelet count, but you don't see a direct effect on the RBC number. So that's why it's, it's you can't necessarily say it causes pancytopenia, but it definitely does big damage to the bone marrow and you could say it causes bone marrow suppression. So that's with ganciclovir. So next, uh, pencyclovir. Pencyclovir you don't see as much of the toxicity because pencyclovir is topical. Remember we said that pencyclovir is the topical form of acyclovir. So you don't get as much of the systemic crystalline nephrotoxicity that you would like as much in acyclovir. This stays more on the surface, so it's not as much of a problem as far as um, the side effects. You may be able to see some rashes and stuff like that if you're allergic to it, but that's about it for that one. So moving in with now Foscarnet. Remember Foscarnet? The way you remember what it is, FOS sounds like pyrophosphate, so it's a pyrophosphate analog that directly inhibits the viral DNA polymerase, 
and the primary um, ones to worry about in this one, again, nephrotoxicity, but not crystalline nephrotoxicity. That's reserved for acyclovir. So nephrotoxicity. And also in this one, you'll see calcium and magnesium chelation. In other words, it's going to lower your calcium and magnesium levels, and it's going to chelate them. So where, where, where is it getting this calcium and magnesium? It's stealing it from the bone. So you could run into a serious issue of bone fragility, especially in patients with osteoporosis. This would be heavily contraindicated in a patient with osteoporosis. And then the last one, sedafavir. Sedafavir. And remember, sedafavir attacks any DNA polymerase. It could be viral, it could be host, it doesn't matter. And what comes with that? Well, you're going to hit pretty much everything. And that means that the nephrotoxicity is heavily pronounced. You have a serious nephrotoxicity with sedafavir, a very high level of nephrotoxicity. And then, so to counteract some of this nephrotoxicity, you can give a drug called perbenicid. And perbenicid, Perbenicid is going to basically send out the toxic metabolites of sedafavir and secrete. So any sedafavir that were to go through the tubule and, you know, is causing those nephrotoxic effects, it is going to, if, if for any of amount of that could have been reabsorbed or not sent out, perbenicid will assist in the secreting of it back into the kidneys. So secretion back into tubules for for the eventual um, excretion in urine. So that's the that's a way to kind of counter some of the severe nephrotoxicity you see in sedafavir. So those are the primary side effects um, to cover the main ones that you'll see tested uh, right there. So the last thing um, I just want to mention, let me get back to my pen setting, is you know you may be wondering, well, what about the what about the mechanisms of resistance? And you'll see this as a trend in so many drugs in pharmacology. When you think of just, if you intuitively know the mechanism of action of these drugs, these drugs right here, you can figure out what the mechanism of resistance would be. For example, let's just take ganciclovir. Ganciclovir, I had said, ganciclovir is a guanosine analog. And it utilizes the fact that viral cells have UL97 kinase. And that is going to put a phosphate group on this nucleoside, this using guanosine. It's going to put the first phosphate group that will then allow the rest of the phosphate groups to follow using the other um, kinases that are, that are in all. So to put the second and third phosphate, that could be in a viral cell and in, in even human host cells. But to be able to put that first phosphate on that starts this whole trend, you have to have this UL97 kinase in the case of the encyclovir. Well, a way, think about intuitively a way that a virus could get around this drug. Well, the way that a virus could get around this drug is what happens if UL97 isn't working? What happened if this is gone? Or if they found another way to put a phosphate on the first, of, to make it the first nucleotide monophosphate, what if they didn't use EO97? What if they use some other kinase? Well, then this drug is useless. So the mechanism of resistance would be a mutated EO97 kinase. What about a cyclovir? A cyclovir, the mechanism of resistance would be a mutated thymidine kinase, which is the kinase that's in viral cells that uh, puts the monophosphate, the first phosphate on the guanosine analog of a cyclovir. That, that's the way that works. So that's how that would work. If you look at pencyclovir, it's just a topical form, the exact same, exact same mechanism of resistance. It also uses thymidine kinase, so a mutated thymidine kinase. Look at phosphornet. It's a pyrophosphate analog. Just if you know intuitively that this drug acts as a pyrophosphate analog and it goes in the pyrophosphate analog binding site of DNA polymerase, and it basically inhibits, then all the, all the virus has to do is block that site. So if it had a mutated pyrophosphate analog binding site, all of a sudden this drug is useless. What about sedafavir? It inhibits viral DNA polymerase. Well, a way around that is what if the virus had, it, had a mutated uh, DNA polymerase? 
then all of a sudden now the only damage we're doing is to host cells because you can't seem to target the drug and the virus anymore. So that's why if you notice a trend in a lot of my pharmacology videos, I don't go over mechanisms of resistance. Because if you learn the mechanisms of action, 90% of the time, maybe even higher, you already know the mechanism of resistance. So this was the quick video on antiviral drugs, specifically the drugs treating herpes simplex virus 1, 2, cytomegalovirus, also known as CMV, and varicella zoster virus. I'll see you in another video. Bye, guys.